The next speaker is Igor Gorbat, who will speak from Fourier angle type transition and commuting differential operations. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the program committee for giving me the opportunity to give uh, 15 minutes talk on my chamber of this Alexander Shadow. Let me start uh, with two examples to explain what I'm going to talk about. And the first, of, the first example takes a step to a work of uh, German mathematician Wallenberg. Which is as follows. Let me start uh, with the uh, lattice. Plane and attach to this lattice uh, the Weierstrass D function. So it is a joint eigenfunction of uh, L and P, but we have appearance of two variables x and z. So let me write it first. Uh, L acting on side xz is part of z side x comma z and 
B acting on X, C is a derivative of pi side X, comma C. And uh, to outline, to, I would like to uh, point out that well, when we apply differentiations and we differentiate with respect to X. So this formula for a joint eigenfunction well matches with the whole formula linking L and P. To complete the story, let me just mention that finding such a joint eigenfunction for operators depending so for partial differential operators uh, well, it's one of major goals in the corresponding research. Well, it was the first example due to Wallenberg. Another example was uh, discovered much later by Xmiya in his very influential paper about uh, properties of the Weil algebra where in particular he stated his celebrated conjecture about endomorphisms of the Weil algebra. Well, the formula is like this. So let me first introduce the following operator Q depending on an arbitrary complex parameter lambda and then uh, we define again a pair of, parameter of operators L and P. So L is the following expression and uh, it's as follows. So again, this media showed that L and P compute, and again uh, it can be checked that uh, they satisfy uh, an equation of a plane cubic curve. Well, in this case, uh, the order of L is 4. The order Six. So on both uh, sides we have operators of order 12, so again it matches and it can be checked. So, uh, these equalities are true. So I have to point out that uh, to find commuting operators with polynomial coefficients is not an easy task. For instance, if we want to get here an affine curve of higher genus, then equations like this were found only recently, two years ago by Miron. And it was a long standing conjecture to find such operators. So you cannot just uh, find them randomly. So it's hard for me to explain how this media came out with these examples. Well, the goal of my talk is uh, to show that certain questions of the theory of commuting differential operators can be solved using methods of the categorical representation theory, which is the main subject of this conference. But uh, to do this, I uh, have first uh, explained some basic theory. And uh, let me start collecting facts. So it is a meta theorem about commuting commutative subalgebra in the algebra of um, <coughs> differential operators whose coefficients are formal power series.
So I think we have such a subalgebra A, and I want it to be non-trivial, so I want it contains at least an element of positive order. Well, the first thing is that A is a serial. So it is a finitely generated commutative algebra. And moreover, it has Roy dimension equal to 1. And consequence of that is uh, that A defines a defined curve, which I would like to denote spectrum of A. And uh, moreover, this fn curve is also integral because A has no zero divisor and A has no zero divisor because we do not have any zero divisors in the algebra of differential operators. So, integral curve a nice thing, but projective curves are better behave. And of course, uh, any fine curve can be completed. But the point is that such an affine curve admits one point compactification by a smooth point. One way to think about points of curves, well, comes from, from the algebraic number theory and uh, say defines points using valuations of the quotient field. So let me take the following uh, valuation. So Q of A <coughs> is uh, field of fractions of A and uh, having such a fraction, so formal fraction of two differential operators, I assign to this the following number, the order of Q minus order of P divided by R. And uh, R is uh, an invariant of the algebra A called rank. And uh, it is nothing but the greatest common divisors, divisor of orders of all elements of A. So we did get an integer here, and well, the formula is correct, so I did want to take difference in this order. This is an evaluation, so it is a map compatible with products and sums. And uh, it defines a smooth point of the compactification of X. And uh, compactification is projective. So, such an algebra A defines canonically a projective curve, and this curve is called spectral curve of E. And uh, X0 is called respectively a fine spectral curve. So, rank uh, I define just uh, to my it explicit because I shall refer to this notion later that uh, in two examples I given in the case of the example of Wallenberg the rank is uh, equal to 1 obviously because 2 and 3 are mutually prime in the case of the example of uh, Bixmier the rank is equal to 2 
<coughs> because two is the uh, greatest common divisor of four and six. However, it is an untrivial statement because uh, if we generate an algebra by L and P, it's by no means obvious, and in the algebra there are no operators of odd degree. So we work with non commuting algebra D, so in principle it could be a possibility to manipulate with L and P and obtain uh, an operator of what order, but it does not happen. Well, the next ingredient I need to talk about the theory is the following module F. So, I take the right ideal generated by X, and then as a vector space, it is just the space of differential operators uh, with constant coefficients. F is, uh, of course, uh, a right D module, so we have right D action, but D contains a commutative subalgebra A, so it is also an A module, so formally speaking a right A module, but since A is commutative, well, I shall prefer the left module notation. Well, the statement is then that this module F is a uh, finitely generated and moreover torsion free as an A module of finite rank. Mathematician Burchnell and Chowdy. 
and Baker. Rational and Chandy written three papers on this subject. And then came another paper of Baker extending them. It turned out that uh, this work was completely forgotten because, uh, well, it was mathematics of cat of its time and there were also no applications at that time. So, works of personal and challenge were discovered because um, uh, first uh, properties of commuting operators, so some technical lemma were written in the classical book of Eins of differential equations. And then, uh, even if uh, central block was not digitalized in the 70s, so the names of personal and Chandy, well was discovered, and then it was possible to trace back and discover the work. Well, mathematicians found, uh, well, the whole story fascinating. And uh, starting with uh, 1978, a really lot of people entered the subject. So uh, among pioneers, I would like to mention Greenfield, who discussed characteristic P case of the story. So in the case of uh, final characteristic, uh, the ring of differential operators get new features. So suddenly you get an imperial center. And uh, the work of Greenfield was actually the beginning well, of his work Landlord's program. Well, the treatment I follow here is essentially due to Mumford, who included singular curves and uh, torsion free sheets in the subject, and well, his work was very algebraic. Novikov started the program of applications of questions like this to the study of soliton equations, Novikov and his school. And uh, it was a really very active field of research in the 80s and later, with important contrib contributions by Verdier, Sigal Wilson, Mulaza, and really, really many other mathematicians. Well, to continue, so let me explain the role of this torsion-free module L. So what do I want to do with that? Well, thanks to Nullstein and that, we can think of points of an affine curve as algebra homomorphism from the coordinate ring to C. Well, because to define such a uh, homomorphism, we just need to say what is uh, kernel, and the kernel stands in bijection with a point. So when I write high, I mean point in what follows. Now, the next thing which plays a role in this situation is a solution space attached to a point high. And uh, by the definition, it is uh, vector space of power series satisfying the condition that the action of the differential operator pi on f is high of pi times f for all pi from a. So in other words, we consider the common eigenspace to all operators of my algebra. So it is uh, a certain vector space. And uh, so what is the property of that? 
So a priori it is not clear like, whether this space is finite dimensional or not and what are the properties of it. But it turns out that this space is always finite dimensional and there is uh, a good way to control it. So let me write the following lemma. It turns out that if I mod out the kernel of hi, tensor into this f, then this quotient is isomorphic to the dual space of the solution space. So it is going to be an isomorphism of vector spaces. So what is the map? So to tell you what the map is, so I prefer to write like this. All right. So f as a vector space is just the space of differential operators with constant coefficients. If I have e power i, then I attach to this a functional. So an element of the solution space is a certain uh, power series. And I can take uh, its uh, i's derivative <coughs> and evaluate at zero, getting a complex number. So it is what the map eta do, and, well, eta, well, is just induced by eta tilde. Again, the property is that eta is an isomorphism of C-vector spaces. So, what does it mean uh, geometrically? So it is uh, the first part. The second part states that the solution space can be actually computed more or less algorithmically, and it is the main point. Namely, we can think about this space as the kernel of a single differential operator R phi where uh, r high is the greatest common divisor of all elements of the form phi minus phi minus 1. But uh, if I write like that, I would like, I, I also have to allow coefficients having poles. So it, lies in the algebra of differential operators whose coefficients are formal Laurent series. The last ring has a property that any left ideal is principal. So we just define the greatest common divisor in a way we do it for polynomials or for integers. If I write like that, then the property that the solution space is a kernel of uh, chi is obvious, more or less. Additional property of this operator is that archi is Fuchsian, which is a certain additional constraint on poles of coefficients, which probably skip. So it is a gross, about rows of poles of coefficients. In particular, from what I said follows, that's a dimension the solution space can be determined as the order of the operator R'. So Fuchsian operators have the properties that any solution does not have poles, so all solutions are given by formal power series. 
Again, so now I am coming to the geometric corollary. I wanted to say anyway. So we can think uh, of A model F as a coherent sheaf uh, on the fine curve. So, in this statement, the statement is really topological. And uh, what this result about uh, the dual solution space was about, here we have the geometric fiber of F over the point chi, and it is just a dual solution space. So, in other words, geometrically, we have our fine structure term, which can be smooth or singular, so both options are possible. And then we have uh, fibers which are essentially given as the space of uh, simultaneous eigenfunctions. So, for point chi, we have a family, uh, we have a vector space F chi, and if we have a smooth point, then the dimension of the fiber is R. So it follows from a combination of geometry and algebra, R is the rank of A. But if F is uh, just uh, torsion free and not locally free, then the dimension of the fiber jumps along singular. So, maybe it's also interesting to mention that, uh, well, vector bundles arising similarly, so it is quite a typical pattern in some applications in physics. So you have an operator you want to study, and then you start to deform it using parameters in a nice way, so the deformation is isospectral. And in uh, this way you get well, variant <coughs> family of vector spaces over the base, and you obtain in such a way vector bundle. And then it turns out that frequently properties of system you want to start, you can be expressed using topology of the vector bundle you construct. Well, in this case, it suggests so on the fine curve, there is no interest in topology. And the uh, more correct object is. Uh, a shift over the projective curve. And it turns out that uh, this uh, module F can be extended to the projective curve in a canonical way, which is given by the following theorem. So let a be a commutative subalgebra in the algebra of differential operators, so in the setting as before. Well, then there exists a unique torsion free sheaf F on the projective spectral curve X characterized by the following two formulas. So, firstly, I wish that on the fine part it gives me the module F I started with, so I want to understand. So I want this isomorphism as uh, modules uh, over A. So, italic F is just a continuation of the Roman F. And uh, to make it unique, I want to impose that the coherent shift has no cohomology. So, possibly it would have shift cohomologies uh, in degree 0 and 1, 
And if we uh, impose a condition, then f is uniquely determined. And just let me mention that variation of cohomologies automatically implies that f is semi-stable. sense of the slope stability of it. So summing up for an algebra A, V defines certain algebra geometric invariants. And uh, so now the main result of uh, the theory is a so-called picture correspondence. Explaining the role <coughs> for the geometric invariance I introduced. So, as I explained to any commutative subalgebra in D, we can attach its uh, spectral invariance x, pi, and f, where x is a spectral curve of A, and x is an integral Pi is the smooth point of X. And F is a torsion free shift with vanishing cohomology. And uh, the first result is uh, that this map is actually subjective. So every spectral triple x comma pi comma f can be realized as a spectral data corresponding to some commutative algebra of differential operators. Most frighteningly is the second part of the story. So when we consider those algebras A having rank 1, which can be rephrased by saying that in A we have a pair of operators of mutually prime degree. Then uh, <coughs> again we have the spectral invariance. The rank of the torsion free shift F is 1. So it is a point of an object called compactified Jacobian. So just Jacobian if uh, x is smooth. Vanishing uh, cohomology means that we can exclude the set called theta divisor. And uh, the statement is that in the rank one case it is a bijection. So, meaning that a commutative of subalgebra A can be recovered from its spectral data. So, to convince you, so let me illustrate it on an example. Say 
turns out, and it is written as a separate, very visible example in the work of personal Charmy, for instance, that any such A has a form C L alpha pi alpha, where L alpha is like in uh, Weilenberg's example, but we may shift the argument so we can do it. So P alpha is defined in a similar way. And uh, alpha is an element of the torus where zero is forbidden. So why don't we like zero? So in this theory, we want coefficients. Anyway, so we want coefficients being a formal power series, but pi has a pole when alpha is equal to zero. So that's why alpha has to be excluded. And this set stands in by ejection with uh, the K group of the torus, excluding the structure shift. So the structure shift has to disappear because it has no trivial cohomology. So we see in the genus one case, pressure correspondence works. It also works in the case of higher genus. And rank case, rank one story was really essentially shown by partial Chandler and Baker in practice. All right. So the question is, uh, what happens in the higher rank case? So this case was uh, uh, not treated by Bershon and Chandy, and it was a point when Kritschewar came followers. All right, so now, so the real part of my talk starts, so I changed, uh, changed the modality and start uh, talking the demo. All right, so what is the question? So what is uh, the first non-trivial case of interest? When the genus of A is equal to zero, then the story is boring. Then uh, the algebra A is just generated by a single operator pi, the spectral curve is pi 1, and the spectral shift is just O minus 1. So there is only one line bundle without cohomology on pi 1. There is some R where R is the order of pi. So here there is nothing to study, all ingredients are obvious. So the first non trivial case arise when the genus is equal to 1 and the rank is equal to 2. And when I say genus, I mean arithmetic genus. So my curves could be singular. And arithmetic genus is so the dimension of the first cohomology space of the structure sheet. All right, so what happens uh, in the genus 1 case? So let me start with some um, elementary geometry. So any integrable integral genus 1 curve is uh, Rashford's cubic. And pi, well, it's a point <coughs> on infinity, so it is a compactifying point. Uh, well, I introduced uh, earlier. So such a curve uh, is smooth. Well, discriminant is uh, non-zero. It uh, could be uh, it could be uh, singular when discriminant is zero and 
unless those parameters are zero, then the curve is nodal, and uh, otherwise the curve has a cuspidal singularity. So the classification of algebras of genus 1 and rank 2 was, of course, a very attractive problem, illustrated by Grisha and Novico, where they used the same method of vector valued beta uh, as a functions, which gave an answer, but the method was applicable only for smooth curves. The classification was uh, then completed by Grunbaum, and Grunbaum was actually an applied mathematician, and here is a reason for be interested in this kind of questions. And his uh, paper appeared in a journal called Journal of Physics D, but it, is, it was actually an algebra paper, and let me explain what Grunbaum did. So we can start with an operator of uh, order 4, and we can, by conjugate it, achieve that the coefficient uh, at the third derivative is zero. Then uh, you can uh, consider an operator pi. So I told you that the story of the theory of a million differential operator started with the work of Gauchinol of Chandy. So it was not quite correct. So the first paper was actually due to Shu, who introduced the ring of pseudo differential operator. Usually you cannot take a square root of differential operator, but uh, Shaw observed a purely algebraic construction, well, allowing to take uh, roots. And, uh, well, if we take differential operator part of that, so we get differential operator pi. And, uh, well, it makes the theory work. And actually, the reason Shaw introduced so the differential operators was uh, his interest in computing differential operators. Again, the work of Shua was forgotten. So it was remembered that he uh, introduced several differential operators, but it was forgotten for what reason. And then it was discovered in the 80s. Then, imposing the Allen pi commute, we get some constraints on the coefficients. And then it is automatic that Allen p satisfy such a relation. We have to work a little bit more to ensure that we get an algebra of rank two, that we do not generate an operator of, uh, of degree. Summary, any genus one algebra has such a shape. Now, computations of Grunbaum uh, carried out with the help of Michael produced the following formula. So it is convenient to write L in such notation. And uh, here's the answer for the coefficients. So L depends uh, on four complex parameters and one function. So it makes the rank two story more complicated. So for rank one algebras, so we have parameters which are algebra geometric, but here you suddenly uh, get a parameter which is arbitrary power series. And, uh, well, we also get the equation of the spectral curve. Well, these coefficients uh, which are explicit in bounds parameters. So, the question posed by Previato and Wilson was very natural. So, what is the spectral shift of B? And, uh, well, they gave an answer on this question in the smooth case. And uh, we wanted to answer the question of Priyato and Wilson in general. So, in the general talk with Jaglow, so we suggested the following procedure. So, we start quite generally. So, let B be an arbitrary commutative so algebra. So, how can we determine? <coughs> and it turns out that, uh, that the trick is to start with the following short exact sequence. So f is a spectral shift. And then vanishing of, of cohomologies of f implies that t is torsion. And moreover, its support belongs to the uh, affine part of x0. Well, evaluation is uh, 
a canonical map. And canonical maps have properties that they can be computed in different incarnations. And it was the key point in the approach. So knowing the greatest common divisors for arbitrary point chi, we actually can determine the support of T. And uh, looking at the order, we can say whether f is locally free or not. Because f is not locally free is when the dimension of the fiber jumps. <coughs> Moreover, we can uh, describe, uh, looking at the greatest common divisor, uh, the determinant. And it is just because, uh, well, we can uh, look at the element in the table and uh, also any terms. Moreover, and it is the whole point that we can determine the torsion shift T, at least when the lens is small. And now the key point is coming. Uh, it turns out that in the genus 1 case, the torsion shift T actually describes F because, uh, well, what we have here, it is uh, the Zeidel Thomas twist of F. And uh, it is known to be an equivalence. It is a Fourier Mokai transform in genus 1 case. So together with Kreuzler, we perform analysis of this correspondence. And it is a tool giving us the answer. So talking about semi-stable shifts on a singular curve again. So the upshot is the following. So semi-stable shifts form a category equivalent to the category of torsion shifts. And in this correspondence, the rank is the length. And uh, being locally free corresponds that the shift T has projective dimension 1. Uh, moreover, well, we have to understand the representation theory of T. And either we have a shift with multiplicity, and or we have support as a singular point. And, uh, if we are considering the composable two-dimensional models, well, then it is uh, well, possible to give an elementary answer. So here is the answer on this question. And in this term, we actually can uh, well, classify uh, spectral sheets. So for example, of Higgs media, uh, the spectral sheet uh, T uh, well, is this one. And uh, well, if we ask ourselves uh, what uh, our operators uh, in uh, corresponding to interposable sheets, which are not locally free, well, we get such a formula, well, curve is singular, well, to say a little bit how it works. So having L, so it is a special case of the previous example, we compute its partner, and then we compute P explicitly, and actually it is clear that the computation was done by Maple. So what can we learn from this formula? So we can compute GCD here. And it turns out that the GCD has order 3, and uh, it means that the shift is not locally free, so as I claimed, because the fiber is three-dimensional. And actually, with a little bit more analysis, we can conclude it is interposable, not locally free. So it is how the method works. And the shift is a, lock, is a free Mukai transform of the following torsion shift. Well, so here is the uh, final answer, so it is going to be my final slide. So again, recalling your Grunbaum's classification, so rank 1 and genus 2 commutatives of algebras of D have such a description. So we have one parameter which is a function and four parameters of the problem. Plus a question, what are spectral sheets? So x is singular and the spectral sheet is the composable if and only if we have such relators, relations and parameters. And uh, well, in this case, we can say what the spectral shift is. So it is a sum of the unique rank 1 locally free shift plus uh, some line bundle without cohomologies. And uh, if 
spectral curve is singular, and Ryama Kai transform of T is supported at the singular point, well, then it happens if and only if when uh, Grunbaum parameters uh, satisfy this relation. Well, here's a condition to be locally free, and then I can also compute it explicitly. Well, to conclude, well, it is always nice to say that we have uh, solved the problem posed by somebody else. Well, but actually I think more interesting that the actual answer is the method. So, we could answer the question of describing a spectral shift, well, using uh, Fourier Mukai transforms, and it was, well, the key tool. So, yesterday, uh, Kenyang told Henning Cloud Asio that uh, translated categories form a right tool to study mathematics. So, it's an opinion I fully share, adding that mathematics sometimes can be also analytic, like here. And 